Hello. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Sounding good? Okay, great. How's everyone doing today? Good. I want to welcome you all today to our members' Lunch and Learn. It's so exciting to have you all. Um, by show of hands, how many of you have seen our special exhibition downstairs? By show of hands. Okay, that's a good amount. So we've got almost everybody, which is very good. I hope you all have been enjoying it. Uh, my name is Meg Bowersox, and I'm the manager of gallery interpretation here at the museum. I know some of you were expecting my colleague, Tyler Putnam, um, but unfortunately he was not able to attend today, but he does wish you all a very happy and enjoyable day. Uh, before we get started with today's program, we do have a very special and exciting a sneak peek for you all. Uh, for one of the things that we do here at the museum, besides all of our daily programs and our walking tours and our gallery highlights tours, which is what I do here at the museum, we also have theatrical performances. And this is a way that we can bring to life these people from the past for our visitors. Not everybody can understand through reading labels or attending a tour or looking at an object. Some people need to feel and experience what that story was like from someone reenacting it. So some of you may have already seen our Meet, Joseph, our Meet James Four in production, um, but for those of you who haven't, we are gonna do a sneak preview for you all right now this afternoon. Um, also, if you would like to see the full performance, we will be doing it today at 3.30 in the Washington War Tent Theater, and we'll remind you all again later on. But I hope you all sit back, relax, and enjoy this program, and I hope you all enjoy meeting James Fortin. William, my dear brother-in-law. So this is the commerce ready to take us to England. It's almost time to set sail, a new voyage, a new opportunity. I know this kind of journey is familiar to you, but this is a new adventure for me. This, this is my home, Dock Ward. The noise of the wharfs the mingling of different accents and languages, Irish, German, West Indian, West African, British. I've spent years watching the arrivals and departures of ships filled with traded goods like this one. Men loading cargo, rope makers at work. I was in awe of the ship's carpenters, shaping the wood and repairing damage from each ship's most recent voyage. I especially loved watching the sailors hoist the sails that my father made. You know how much we all talk about my father, Thomas. My father taught me to read. We would practice reading scripture, or father would teach me the words of the hymns that we sang on Sundays. As a boy, I followed him to Robert Bridges' sail loft, where he worked alongside white and black men the only free African there. Now, my father was meticulous in his work. He gave close and careful attention to every sail he crafted. I would sit close to him, watching as he laid out the canvas across the floor and cut out the shapes of the sails. The sails, the sails were so big, they had to be hoisted through the window. I had to steer clear of the way so not to get knocked down by their size and weight. When I got older, my father began teaching me sail making. I'd help out around the loft by sweeping the floor or picking over scrap canvas to preserve the usable pieces. I'd prepare beeswax for sewing thread. It's sweet, honey -ish smell at my fingertips. My father, he gave me the sail making fid. It was his. I learned how to use it. Stretching the canvas for grommets, I even learned how to sew a few canvas pieces myself. And at the end of the day, my hands were stiff and feet ached from all the work. My devout Anglican father reminded me that God would indeed bless us if we followed the work of the Lord and not of men. Eventually, he ventured on his own, making a few sales here and there. I was proud to be following in his footsteps. Thank you.
Awesome. Well, thank you, Nathan, so much. Another round of applause for Nathan Alfred Tate. Uh, and I will just say, it has been a pleasure working with Nathan throughout this entire exhibition and even prior to the exhibition opening about Black Founders, the Fortin family of Philadelphia. Uh, and we're really excited to have him here. And again, if you would like to see the full 25 minute performance, you are more than welcome to do that at 3.30. We also have a couple of other performances lined up, which we'll talk about in a, few, in a little while. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go over to some housekeeping. So uh, we'll be introducing our first speaker who will be talking for the first half and we'll be following a Q&A. After that, we'll have a short tea and coffee break to get everyone re-energized for part two. Uh, well, we'll have an additional speaker. We'll also be introducing them with Adrian Whaley, our Director of Education and Community Engagement. And then the, we'll close it out by three o'clock. There'll also be a book signing, and you can also purchase books as well here, but also in the gift shop downstairs. Uh, but before we get started, I also wanted to introduce our next speaker, who will be introducing our speaker for the first part. Uh, and that, was, that is Margot McGinty, who we can see right here. Uh, and she's gonna be introducing our first guest. And I've only met Margot a few months ago, but she's been a treasure since I've met her. And she is one of our most passionate supporters here at the museum and is active in our George Washington Council. And she's also a part of the Collection Society, as well as being a, re a leader of our Revolutionary Society as well, too. She's always recommending great books, including Eric's, which we're going to hear just a little bit about in just a few moments. And we are so lucky to have here today, here, her here today but also to be a big supporter of this museum. Um, so please, without further ado. Hi, thank you so much, Meg. Yes, I love Meg. I need to I have to follow Nathan, that's not easy. Um, my name's Margo McGinley. As Meg told you, I'm involved in several groups uh, at this museum. I love this museum. <laughs> Everyone now knows that I'm very passionate about this place. If you want to speak to me about anything afterwards, I'd love to. I'm always willing to <laughs> sing their praises. Now, on to Eric. Um, last summer, my family and I went on a summer vacation to Boston. I am now known to lead these revolutionary history tours with my family. We, my husband's here, Joe. We have five children. I drag them everywhere now. <laughs> I think it gets in the brain somehow. And um, we spend a day in Chatham because I always lure them with beach time eventually when we get through everything else. And we were walking by a, book, a store called Yellow Umbrella Books. I made everyone stop. I had to go in, check out the books. There was a book, Rebels at Sea, calling my name. I went over, I bought it. It actually was signed by the author though. I brought it to get more personalized today. Um, I bought that book, I read it, I loved it. I had it in my lockbox for later. Uh, I went to um, a meeting at the museum in December and, I, and they're talking about the upcoming James Fortin exhibit. And I'm like, James Fortin, why do I know that name? Why is it familiar? I couldn't figure it out. I went home, I was looking through my library of books and I found it. Rebels at Sea, there's a chapter called Black Patriot in it about James Fortin. So I was very excited to tell the museum and share it with them. Hannah had already just started looking into it when, we, when I found out that um, Eric was scheduled for the June for this lecture today. Um, the staff, being the exquisite people that they are, asked if I would like to introduce him. I couldn't have been more thrilled and I'm really happy that today has finally come. I've been quite excited for it. Now on to... The man of the hour. Um, Eric J. Dolan is the author of 15 books, including Leviathan, The History of Whaling in America, which was chosen as one of the best nonfiction books of 2007 by the Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe, and also won the 2007 John Lyman Award for US Maritime History. His most recent book, Before Rebels at Sea, is A Furious Sky, The 500-Year History of America's Hurricanes, which was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize and was chosen as one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Booklist, Library Journal, and the editors at Amazon. It was also selected as a must-read book by the Massachusetts Center for the book, of the, a book for 2020. Rebels at Sea, the book he will 
talk about now, was awarded the Francis Tavern Museum Book Award for 2023, very exciting, and has also been selected as a must-read book for 2023. He is a graduate of Brown, Yale, and MIT, where he received his PhD in environmental policy. He also lives in Marblehead, Massachusetts with his family. He will be signing books at the end of today. If you're interested, I highly encourage you to get one. And welcome, Eric. Now, oh, we're going to go right into this. Well, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thanks for inviting me to give this talk today. I've never been to this museum before. I had the opportunity to see the exhibit downstairs this morning, and it's absolutely fantastic. Now, I don't want to get your hopes up too high because only a small part of my book deals with James Fortin, so most of this talk is not going to be about him. But uh, that presentation earlier was really wonderful. Now, this was put on a PC. This is not my normal computer, so I just wanted to ask, he didn't tell me, which button do I use to advance the slide? Is it the page down? You can use uh, these buttons right there. Oh, OK. Or you can use the remote right next to it. Oh, OK. Great, great. OK. Oh, that might work better. OK. Anyway, thank you very much again. It was late in the day on June 3rd of 1780 when Salem Captain Jonathan Harridan and his privateer vessel, the Pickering, were heading for the friendly port of Bilbao, Spain. The British privateer Achilles, however, was in the way. Nobody would have faulted Harridan had he fled in the face of this superior foe. While the Pickering had a crew of 38 men and 16 cannons, the Achilles had a crew of 120 men and 43 cannons. Hardly a fair fight, but that's not the way that Harridan saw it. He looked forward to striking a blow for the revolutionary cause. When one of the British prisoners informed Harridan of the Achilles' might, he responded calmly, I shan't run from her. And he didn't. As the Achilles began its advance, Harridan told his men that though the Achilles appeared to be superior to them in force, he had no doubt that they should beat her off if they were firm and steady and did not throw away their fire. Meanwhile, in Bilbao, Word quickly spread that there was about to be this massive maritime battle just off the coast, and about a thousand people rushed to the beach to watch the spectacle, sort of like a colonial version of rubbernecking on a highway. <laughs> Booming broadsides and musket fire filled the air. One of Harridan's crew said that while shot flew around him, Harridan was as calm and steady as amidst a shower of snowflakes. The battle raged for more than two hours, and then Harridan asked his men, or ordered his men, to load the cannons with bar shot, which is essentially a cannonball that's been cut in half and each side affixed to an iron bar. So when that came out of the cannon, it started spinning very rapidly, and it could shred sails, rigging, and even damage a mast or a spar if it knocked into it, and it did a devastating number on the Achilles. And even though the Achilles was damaged mightily, it still was fast enough to get away. Harridan tried to chase it. So Harridan spun about, and he reclaimed the Golden Eagle, which was a British merchant ship that he had earlier captured and that the Achilles had took away from him temporarily. On the Pickering, eight men had been injured. One had his head sheared off by a cannonball. Now, I want you to take a look at this plaque. This is the upper third of a plaque that's about three feet wide and four feet tall. It was placed in Salem, Massachusetts in 1909 by the Sons of the American Revolution, and it was supposed to honor uh, Harridan and his exploits with the Pickering. While I was working on the book, I read about this plaque, and it said it was on the side of a house in Salem. I don't know how many of you have been to Salem, Massachusetts. Have you been to the Witch House in Salem, Massachusetts? It was supposed to be in the intersection where the Witch House was. Now remember, this is during COVID. I live in Marblehead, which is right next to Salem. So I hopped on my bike, I rode over, I looked around this square, 
I found a lot of historic plaques, but not this one. So I went back home and I called up a local historian and said, what happened to that plaque for Jonathan Harden? And she laughed and she said, well, it's down the street inside of a Korean barbecue restaurant. <laughs> so I got back on my bike, I went over, I walked into the Korean barbecue restaurant. The woman was so excited to see me because she didn't have a single customer. And I, unfortunately, I said, I'm not here to get food. I'm here to look at that plaque behind your head. And there it was. And I think that the placement of the plaque, not that I have anything against Korean barbecue restaurants, which I don't, but the placement of this plaque, which at one time had been so important, I think is emblematic of the way in which privateering has been treated in the annals of American history. It sort of has been shunted aside. Now, Hardin remained in Bilbao for two months before heading back to Salem, and across the Atlantic, he captured two more British prizes, sent them into Salem, and when he returned to his hometown, the owners of the Pickering honored their intrepid captain by giving him this engraved tankard. It has an image of the Pickering on the side and his initials and two accompanying mugs. Now, during his tenure in the Massachusetts Navy and as a privateer, Harridan captured many prizes, brought back hundreds of cannons and as many prisoners. And when he died in 1803, at the age of 59 of tuberculosis, his obituary in the Salem Gazette lauded him as one of the most able and valiant commanders that the war had produced. The Pickering was one of nearly 2,000 American privateers during the war, and Harridan was one of roughly 30 to 40,000 privateersmen who fought on board those vessels. A privateer was an armed vessel that had government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war and to bring those ships in as prizes of war. That permission came in the form of a letter of mark, which was a formal legal document that gave the owner the right to capture belligerent ships and bring them in for adjudication. The proceeds from the auctions of these privateers was split equally between the owners and investors in the privateer and the people who served on board the ships. Now, despite the contributions made by Harridan and tens of thousands of other privateersmen, many believe that privateer privateering was just a sideshow during the war, and it has long been given short shrift in histories of the conflict. Rebels at Sea fills that void by offering a comprehensive account of privateering that shows that they were central to the war effort. American privateersmen took the maritime fight to the British and made them bleed in countless daring actions against British merchant ships and not a few warships. Uh, privateers caused British maritime insurance rates to rise precipitously, diverted critical British resources to protecting their own merchant fleet and to attacking American pri privateers, added to British weariness over the war and played a critical role in bringing France into the war on the side of the Americans, which was a major turning point in the conflict. On the domestic front, privateering brought in much, need, brought in much needed goods to the colonies, uh, provided cash infusions for the war effort, boosted coastal economies through the building, outfitting, and supplying of privateers. And also, perhaps most importantly, it gave Americans some confidence that they might actually be successful in this quixotic war against the most powerful nation in the world. Now, thousands of books approach the, have approached the American Revolution from virtually every angle. Rebels at Sea places privateersmen at the very center of the conflict. It demonstrates that when the United States was only a tenuous idea, they stepped forward and risked their lives to help make it a reality. In fighting against the British on the oceans, the Americans relied on four separate forces. There were state navies, there was Washington's secret navy, which operated for about a year and a half at the beginning of the war. There was the Continental Navy, and there were privateers. And of these four, privateers were by far the most numerous and the most effective. They captured somewhere on the order of 1,600 to 1,800 British ships, which were valued at many millions of pounds. 
Now, Massachusetts was the first colony to authorize privateering in November of 1775, and the importance of the Massachusetts Privateering Act could better be understood in hindsight. About 35 years after the end of the American Revolution, John Adams, who was a huge fan of privateering, would write that the passage of the Massachusetts Act is one of the most important documents in history. The Declaration of Independence is a trifle in comparison with it. Now, I hesitate to say that in Philadelphia, <laughs> but I think at the time it was probably true. But since then, I think the Declaration of Independence has taken on slightly more importance. Now, New Hampshire and Rhode Island followed suit in early 1776 with their own privateering statutes, and at the same time, pressure was growing for the Continental Congress to authorize privateers so they could go out from every single colony, not just those few that had stepped forward at the outset. And Congress, in fact, passed a privateering law on March 23rd of 1776. With their capital tied up at the docks, ship owners really wanted to send out privateers. It kept their ships active, and any prizes that they brought back could be sold, helping them with their bottom line. Now, Elias Haskett Derby of Salem, he not only owned 39 privateers during the American Revolution, but he's purportedly the first American millionaire, and much of his fortune came from privateering. If you look closely at this painting, you might be able to tell that almost as interesting as his privateering background to me is the fact that he has one blue and one brown eye. I just think that's cool. There's also, there's also a wharf in Salem that's named after Mr. Derby. Uh, many men invested in privateers. Indeed, privateering spurred a speculative frenzy across the colonies. One of the more illustrious speculators was General George Washington, who invested in at least one privateer, appropriately enough, called the General Washington. Other people who invested in privateers included Generals Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox, as well as Paul Revere. Now, privateer captains would usually be hired as a function of being known by the owners of the vessel, and uh, they would get the largest share of any prizes taken. Now, take a look at this guy, Elias Davis Sr. He, his ship actually received the last letter of mark during the American Revolution. Now, once again, you have to remember, I wrote this book during COVID. My daughter, who works in New York as a literary agent, was home for over a year. My son, who was in college at the time, was home. My wife was home from her work, and they were all working in the kitchen, and I was working in my office. And I have to tell you that during that time, they are the absolute worst coworkers that I have ever had because I like to chat, I'm alone a lot, and I used to come out of my room, and I'd wanna talk, and they're very serious people, and they work really hard, and it wasn't until the end of the day that I could let off steam. But I always wanna get my kids interested in my books. Uh, they hadn't read any of my books. My daughter had read one, my pirate book. My son, who's a cybersecurity guy, still hasn't read any of my books. But I tried to get them interested. So when I saw Elias's picture, I called my daughter, Lily, into the room, and she was single at the time, she still is. I'm, I'm not making a pitch for her, she just happened to be in New York. Uh, anyway, she, I said, Lily, take a good look at Elias here. He was a privateering captain, and Lily took a good long look at Elias, and she said, you know, Dad, I could really get into privateering. <laughs> so, but, and she's read the book, actually. <laughs> But anyway, well now while crewmen were sometimes known by the, private, by the privateer vessel, the owners of the privateering vessels, uh, many times they were not, and they had to be recruited. And one of the ways in which crews were recruited for privateers was through something called the hearty welcome, where the owner would basically pay for drinks at a local pub, people would come down and get sloshed, and then they would sign the articles of agreement. Now here's the man of the day, and I learned, actually I wasn't quite, I think I was aware, but I had forgotten that we don't really know exactly what he looked like. There are a few pictures that vie for this, but this is the one that I think the museum and most people refer to as being of James Fortin in his later years. Now black men served on many privateers just as they fought in the American Revolution in many different uh, regiments. Some of them were freemen, like James Fortin here, uh, when he was 14, he signed on to the Royal Lewis, 
which is a privateer. And I have to add that the exhibit downstairs has a wonderful background about this little story that I'm going to tell. Now, part of the reason he signed on to the Royal Lewis is that in uh, July 8th of 1776, he was in Philadelphia, and he heard them read the Declaration of Independence. And when he heard those ringing words that all men are created think equal, uh, he thought, does this apply to people like me? And later in 1780, Pennsylvania became the first in America, the first colony in America, or state to be, to pass an abolition of slavery law. It was only a gradual abolition of slavery law. And if you were born to enslave people, you would become free at the age of 28. But those two things helped influence James Fortin in the sense that he wanted to fight for his country to be. So he signed on to be a privateer. He was uh, one of the young men on board the Royal Lewis that would bring ammunition and powder to the cannons. The first cruise was a success. The Royal Lewis, under the leadership of Stephen Decatur Sr., captured seven British merchant ships, brought them back to Philadelphia, where they were sold for quite a healthy uh, fee. And, uh, yeah. And, um, he came back in, he was very excited, shared some of the money with his family, and he decided to go back out on the Royal Lewis for a second cruise. In hindsight, he shouldn't have been so eager because barely a day out of port, the Royal Lewis was captured by Her Majesty's ship, military ship, the, um, uh, duh, 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 totally spaced on the name, the Amphion, the HMS Amphion, captained by a guy named John Baisley. Now, James Fortin was very concerned because he knew that most men of his complexion who were captured by the British during the war would be sent to a slave mart in the Sugar Islands in the Caribbean, and he thought that was going to be his fate. But fortunately for him, Captain John Baisley had a 12-year-old son on board who needed a companion. So he tapped Fortin to be that companion, and over the period of a number of weeks, Fortin did such an excellent job that when they pulled into New York Harbor, Captain Baisley gave Fortin a choice. He said, you can either disembark here with the other men of the Royal Lewis and all the other prisoners and go on to the Jersey prison ship, or you can go to London as the ward, essentially, of my son, where you will have money, your freedom, education, and a great life. What do you choose, James Fortin? And James Fortin chose to go with the men of the Royal Lewis. And he actually spent uh, almost eight months on board the Jersey before being exchanged in a prisoner swap. And no doubt he was helped in achieving that end by Captain John Baisley, who when he dropped off the men in New York, he told the superintendent of prisons to keep an eye on James Fortin. And if any opportunity for a prisoner swap came about, please put him at the head of the list because he was wonderful to my son on board the ship, because as you'll learn later in the talk, most people on the Jersey did never left there, they, they died. Now, other black men during the American Revolution and privateers were enslaved men who ran away from their owners in order to gain their freedom. Other times, owners rented out their enslaved individuals as a money-making operation. Now, this painting fascinated me when I came across it. It was owned by a urologist in Rhode Island, that's not why it fascinated me. But um, anyway, it was thought to be the only known painting of a black American privateersman during the American Revolution. And as such, it was used in many books on the American Revolution and Francis Tavern wanted to use it as a centerpiece for one of their exhibits on black patriots during the American Revolution in the early 2000s. So they got in touch with the urologist said, can we use this painting? He said, absolutely. Let me send it out to an art restorer to get it spiffed up a little bit. The art restorer took a solvent, started rubbing the black hand, one of them. Off came the black paint, revealing the white hand beneath. Because in the mid 20th century, somebody realized that a unique painting of a black privateersman during the American Revolution be worth much more than a slightly more common painting of a white mariner during the American Revolution, basically doctored the image. And they were right. 
when it was thought to be a black privateersman, it was estimated to be worth $300,000. When they discovered that it was a forgery of sorts, its value plummeted to $3,000. And Franz's Tavern backed out of wanting to use it, the centerpiece of their exhibition. The urologist died and gave it to his son, who is a friend of mine. That's sort of how I found out about it, who still has the painting to this day. Now, many have argued that privateersmen were motivated more by greed than patriotism. John Paul Jones, the dashing individual shown here and famed naval officer, believed it was nothing but greed. A less cynical assessment views privateersmen as being motivated by a combination of profits and patriotism, and I think that view is very much closer to the truth. The perspective of most privateersmen is reflected by the comments of a privateersman and soldier Christopher Prince, who said, looking back on his long revolutionary career, through the whole course of the war, I've had two motives in view. One was the freedom of my country, and the other was the luxuries of life. Privateers experienced many triumphs and tragedies during the war. One of the most successful privateers was Pennsylvania's own brig, the Hulker, which over the span of four years, with numerous captains, went out on many cruises, and brought back 72 British ships. During one particularly successful cruise, the Hulker captured 10 very large, heavily laden British merchant ships, brought them back to Philadelphia, and sold them at the docks for nearly 2 million pounds. Now, one of the worst tragedies to befall privateers during the war was what was called the Penobscot Affair. It was the largest maritime force, force assembled during the Revolution. It was 19 warships, 12 of which were privateers. Their mission was to dislodge British forces that were building a fort, Fort George, on a little spit of land in Penobscot Bay, where modern day Castine is today. And the reason the British wanted to build that fort was to have a base from which they could send forth ships to attack all the privateering nests up and down the coast that were causing them so much trouble. Now, the expedition sailed from Boston on July, um, July 19, 1779. Poor organization and leadership, and a critical delay in launching the attack led to an absolute fiasco. When on August 14th, the Royal Navy showed up at the mouth of Penobscot Bay in force. It was a complete rout. In the end, 16 American ships were burned by their own men to keep them from falling into British hands, and the rest were either scuttled or captured by the British. As for the men, they bolted into the woods, and there were nearly 3,000 Americans on board those ships. They bolted into the woods and desperately tried to make it down south to Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And uh, how many people died in this affair is not clearly known. Estimates range from about 33 to about 500. I think that it's somewhere in the middle. And many have labeled it the most devastating maritime loss that America sustained up until uh, December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Now, one of the most important things that privateers did during the American Revolution was to help bring France into the war on the side of the Americans. In the early years of the war, France allowed American privateers to use their ports in the Caribbean and on the continent to reprovision sell items, and also bring on board French sailors to supplement their crews. All of this was in violation of treaties that France had with Great Britain. And that, plus the devastation that the American privateers wrought on British ship shipping, caused the British to become infuriated. The Continental Congress sent William Bingham, to the French colony of Martinique, where a large part of his job was to encourage American privateering. And he did a wonderful job at that because in 1778, it was estimated that already American privateers had captured nearly 250 ships in the Caribbean alone. And that resulted in a 66% uh, reduction in British trade with their Sugar Islands. And keep in mind that British trade with their Sugar Islands was the number one source of external currency for Britain at this time. So alarming were these figures that the Earl of Suffolk urged Parliament to keep them from the public. 
pointing out the impropriety of acknowledging what ought not to be acknowledged at so critical a period, the weakness of the nation. Meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin, who was in France, he seemed to be everywhere, he was in France to negotiate a formal alliance, was convinced that privateering was helping with the American cause uh, with the French, while at the same time injuring Britain. That which makes the greatest impression in our favor here, Franklin wrote, is the prodigious success of our armed ships and privateers. London's public advertiser asserted that if France continued to allow American ships and privateers in particular to sail from their ports, an immediate war between France and this country will be the inevitable consequence. The critical turning point in getting France to come into the war on the American side, of course, was the brilliant victory at the Battle of Saratoga on October 17th of 1777, when British General John Burgoyne's army surrendered. Now, while privateering uh, caused, didn't cause a sharp turn in American fortunes on, it own, on its own, it did help to create the environment in which such a brilliant American victory could prove, prove decisive in bringing France into the conflict. Now, it did so by greatly increasing the enmity between Britain and France and seriously damaging the British economy. Now, arguably the most terrific chapter in the American Revolution and the most difficult chapter for me to write in the book was the one that focused on the British prisons, both in New York Harbor and in England. Uh, the bulk of the prisoners on these ships were American privateersmen. In England, there were two British prisons, Mill and Fortin Prison. Between them, they held about 3,000 men during the span of the war. The average annual death rate was between 3 and 6 percent, which is about average for a prison of this era. Now, Mill and Fortin prisons were bad enough, but by far the worst experience any combatant had to endure was to be on one of the 19 prison ships in New York Harbor. The Jersey, which is the one that is shown here, was probably the worst. Between 15,000 and 22,000 men were on these ships throughout the war. All of them were dreadful, but the Jersey, as I mentioned, was the worst. It was nicknamed Hell Afloat. The Jersey had been a fourth-rate 64-gun British warship that was essentially dismasted and moored in about 4 to 12 feet of water in Wallabout Bay, which is near Brooklyn today. Think about it, between 800 and 1,200 men were kept on that ship below decks 23 hours a day for sometimes many, many months. They were only allowed an hour a day to come up on the main deck when they were watched over by guards and actually see the outer world. Between six and 12 men died on the Jersey every day. And keep in mind, this is where James Fortin was for nearly eight months. Every morning as the sun rose, guards would yell, rebels, bring up your dead. And not only did they have to bring up the dead, they also helped to row them to the nearby spit of land where they were buried in shallow graves. So whenever bad weather rolled in or there was a storm, sometimes those graves would be uncovered and the men on the deck of the Jersey could look just a few hundred yards away and see the bones of the people that used to share the space on the ship with them. And I actually gave a talk in New York not too long ago, and somebody who lives in Brooklyn says, to this day, occasionally, a bone is found when they're doing either archeological research or they're digging for a new building. Now, one inmate left the following damning portrait of his time on the Jersey. He wrote, there were about 1,100 prisoners on board. There were no berths or seats to lie down on, not a bench to sit on. Many were almost without clothes. The dysentery, fever, frenzy, and despair prevailed among them and filled the place with filth, disgust, and horror. The scantiness of the allowance, the bad quality of the provisions, the brutality of the guards, and the sick pining for comforts they could not obtain, altogether furnished continually one of the greatest scenes of human distress and misery ever beheld. The number of deaths on the Jersey alone is hard to believe. It's probably around 11,500. And the vast majority of those were American privateersmen. 
By comparison, during the entire war, only in the vicinity of 4,000 to 6,800 men were killed in the direct line of fire, Americans. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of privateers is that they siphon valuable manpower from the Continental Navy, and that's absolutely true. Many men chose to join privateers rather than to go into the Navy because of the hope of making more money in a shorter period of time and also having to deal with less rigid discipline. But that doesn't mean that if there had been no privateering that the Continental Navy would have been suddenly transformed into a fearsome fighting force. There are roughly 60 Continental Navy warships operating the Atlantic at various times during the American Revolution. Building and assembling a navy from scratch would have been a gargantuan task for a well-funded, well-operating government. The Continental Congress was anything but. So the Continental Navy came together in fits and starts. The Continental Navy's record in battle is not an enviable one. 28 vessels were captured or destroyed, and many others were lost at sea, sold or returned to France, or burned to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. At war's end, just a few Navy ships were left. There were, however, some bright spots for the Continental Navy. Raids on Caribbean munitions depots brought back valuable gunpowder. Uh, the Continental Navy ships did an excellent job of transporting diplomats and materials across the Atlantic, and they captured roughly 200 British prizes. Whoops, what is that? Oh, you can't see it. So, uh, two, uh, two error messages just came up on the computer. No, they, just, they went away. I just, I clicked on them, but I, it, it would have been worse. It was like a big raspberry, a book, or a book you, you, but you didn't see it. Anyway, uh, John Adams in July of 1780, keep in mind, John Adams, big fan of privateering, big fan of the Continental Navy, but he wrote uh, the following, reflecting on the fortunes of the Continental Navy. In looking over the long list of vessels belonging to the United States taken and destroyed, and recollecting the whole history of the rise and progress of our Navy, it is very difficult to avoid tears. The American Revolution was the Navy's first hour, but it was not its finest. We're almost done. In the absence of a powerful Navy, America relied heavily on privateers. Under the circumstances, that was the best strategy available. Now, on the home front, privateers contributed materially to the American economy, and certainly to the economy of Philadelphia, which was a main privateering hub during the war. It was a great economic boon for coastal towns and cities. It kept many businesses afloat and created many new businesses and also created new fortunes. And interestingly enough, one profession that really made out during the American Revolution were lawyers. And I have a great letter in the... <laughs> I clap for the lawyers, okay. A great, there's a great letter in the book uh, about one guy writing to his friend who's a lawyer saying, you're having the time of your life, great business, because every prize that came in, they had to get a lawyer to do the documents for the sale and also the letters of Mark. Sometimes they would get involved. So it was a heyday for lawyers. And also the privateers in themselves, who were mostly from the lower echelons of society, they you were able to use their money if they earned it, uh, instead of getting captured and being thrown on one of the prison ships, to help out their families. Each prize auction delivered a new stream of commodities into the colonies. In August of 1779, a thankful Pennsylvanian told Congress that privateers have rendered us the most essential services and brought us many articles for public and private use, without which the war could hardly have been supported. There was one privateer, however, who was very upset about his role in contributing to the local economy. He returned home from a cruise in February of 1779, only to discover that his hard-earned savings had been depleted by his wife. He took out an ad in the local newspaper that read as follows. Whereas Elizabeth, the wife of me, the subscriber has run me in debt while I was at sea, wasting my substance by riotous living. And as I am in danger of being further run in debt by the said Elizabeth, this is to warn all persons harboring or trusting her 
on my account for the future, as I will not pay one farthing from this date. Whether the marriage lasted is unknown, but I, I doubt it. <laughs> now, the formal end of the war came on September 3rd of 1783 when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Surviving privateers were transformed into American merchant ships, and they played their part in transporting America's wares to distant ports, proudly flying the nation's new flag. And one of Philadelphia's own, Stephen Gerard, was involved in the privateering business, also became quite wealthy after the war in particular. And he got engaged in the China trade, which is one of the big trades that started right after the American Revolution. And an awful lot of privateering vessels were transformed into service in the, the China trade. Now, the men who owned and financed the privateers, as well as those who had chosen to fight for their country on the decks of those vessels, looked back on their accomplishments with pride and wondered, as did all Americans, what the future would bring for themselves and their new country. And I will answer one question. I'll answer any questions you want, but I'm going to answer one question preemptorily because I'm always asked it. What am I working on next? It's like you're a Hollywood play, like a Broadway play. What, you're only as good as your last play or review. So I will tell you what I'm working on next. Actually, I finished working on it. I handed in a new book about two months ago. It's going through the editing process now. And it has nothing to do with the American Revolution. Sorry. It, uh, it's about five men, two British, two Americans, three British, who were intentionally marooned on the Falkland Islands during the War of 1812. And it's a tale of treachery, deceit, survival, and penguins. No. <laughs> Anyway, that's and I'm looking around for a topic right now. So if you have any great topics, let me know. I think I found one. But uh, thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, we'll be taking questions. I'll be passing around the mic. Our first one is actually coming from online, which is given all the research that you've done uh, for this book, would you consider to have been yourself a privateer in the 18th century? <laughs> well, I like to think that had I been around and of age during the American Revolution, <laughs> that I would have chosen wisely and fought for the American cause and maybe have been a privateer or joined uh, the military in some way and, and given my uh, support. But I got to tell you, being a writer is a lot easier. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's fair. <laughs> okay, I did see that somebody had their hand raised, so I'm going to get over to them. First great talk, thank you. Thank you. How, can you explain to me the mechanism of how you capture a ship and you keep it under your control right. to get it back to port? It's not like you, I mean, you're not going to kill all the crew. Um, how do you make that happen? Good question. Uh, uh, basically, the reason privateering vessels had such large crews, like you could have a 60-foot privateering vessel with 120 men on board. That was done for a reason. And the reason was that when you captured a prize, you would peel off eight or 10 of your men, appoint a prize master of, from those eight or 10 men, put them on the captured vessel where the prisoners were either manacled or they were transferred to the privateering vessel, or sometimes, very rarely, uh, let go in another ship that happened to be available, or an earlier one that they captured. And your prize crew would take the vessel back to New London, Philadelphia, wherever. So the more successful you became, the smaller your crew became, and there became a point of diminishing returns where you would have to go back to your port to replenish your crew. And that's why most privateering cruises for only about two to four months, maybe. Sometimes they were just a couple of weeks if you were very successful. But there were some privateering vessels that made a bad choice. And there's one called the Eagle out of London, which I talk, New London, which I talk about in the book. And they were very successful at capturing British ships in and around Long Island Sound and Block Island Sound. But they captured too many prizes that had to be sent back to New London. So it got to the point where there were only 16 Americans on board the Eagle with 17 British prisoners. A couple of the British prisoners got free of their restraints, rose up, killed every man on board the Eagle except for two cabin boys, 
probably 12 year old boys and that was very common on uh, privateering vessels at the time. And they took the ship to Newport, which was in British control at that time. So that, that's the way, you basically started off with a large crew, you peeled off people from your crew to take the vessels back and then you got to the point where you either couldn't operate the ship or you couldn't attack another ship and you'd go back to port. But it sort of tack on to that first question. I tell you, when you read about the American Revolution, when you read about any war, you know, as I know it's trade saying, war is hell. And uh, it's horrible. I mean, being on a ship in the 1700s, even when you're not in war time, was very tough duty. But these people had real guts. The people, James Fortin, all these other people that fought for their country to be. I mean, it was a major decision. And you really were putting your life on the line. Not so much from being killed directly by enemy fire, but disease, even back then, as in the Civil War, took even more people or being captured and put in a prison ship. Uh, it, I really have a lot of respect for the people that helped create our country, not just the politicians, but the one that actually did the fighting and dying. It reminds me of my favorite movie. I love It's a Wonderful Life when he's talking to the potter in the bank and Jimmy Stewart says, you know, the people, the one that are doing the living, the dying, the the actual fabric of society and it's uh, the privateersmen, they were that. They went back, they melted back in the ones that were alive at the end of the war, melted back into the local communities. Most of them who weren't the captains of the ships or the owners were poor to begin with and went back to being poor or lower class individuals that faded from the history books. Uh, so it really, I, I really liked writing this book. It was, uh, made me feel really good and, and uh, about this piece of history coming to light. Great, next question. So what was the source of the, um, uh, the funding for you know, buying all of this stuff? I mean, the continental script was worthless. So I assume this is what, British currency? Where did it come from? And who were these people who were buying all this stuff? We well, have to keep in mind, before, on the eve of the American Revolution, Americans, despite what you may have been told, were among the richest per capita in the Western uh, Hemisphere. So there was a lot of money floating around in the colonies at the time, and not all of it after the war began was continental currency. And you're right, as the war wore on, continentals were not worth a continental. But there was a lot of Spanish silver dollars, which was still a very good currency, and that was sort of the universal currency at the time. So people like Robert Morris of Philadelphia, the financier of the revolution, these people had very deep pockets. A lot of the merchants already had a lot of money, a lot of connections, and a lot of them already owned their vessels. So their vessels were just trans, were transformed into privateering vessels. So it's not as if they had to go out and buy a new ship. And then when they captured these prizes, a lot of the British merchant ships that were brought in were transformed into privateers and sent back out to uh, keep marauding. And also a lot of the ships that were brought in had money on board, specie, silver coins, gold coins, other supplies. So even though a lot of people were in really dire straits during the American Revolution in currency, increasingly the currency that the Continental Congress uh, caused to be printed was relatively worthless, there still was a lot of money and resources in the colonies. In fact, when the Bank of Philadelphia started up, a lot of uh, very wealthy Pennsylvanians and some others from other states contributed to a fund that raised a lot of money to help prosecute the war, because that was part of the problem. We kept running out of money uh, to pay our soldiers and uh, just have the operations of the government. And so a lot of Philadelphians, including Robert Morris, uh, William Bingham, and uh, Blair McClanahan, uh, sort of the King Midas of privateering from Philadelphia, they contributed thousands of British pounds. There was still British money here too as well. And they contributed in the order of five to 10,000 pounds sterling to this fund that helped in turn fund the war effort. But it was very touch and go. And after the war, we had a, a recession. Uh, but America started to bounce back. It was a rocky first 20 or 30 years I mean, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of times during the American Revolution we should have lost the war. I mean, I'm convinced that if the British hadn't been so arrogant and they had really put all their resources towards suppressing the rebellion, which quote unquote started in 
you know, Massachusetts and New England and then filtered down. Um, I think they would have been successful within a relatively short period of time if they hadn't viewed us as a rabble in arms and had taken us a bit more seriously. And also if a hundred different things hadn't happened just right during the war, it could have gone in a totally different direction. And that's basically my argument is that privateering wasn't the sole reason. It was one of many puzzle pieces that contributed to the ultimate success of what George Washington called a standing miracle uh, that we won the war. I'm glad we did. I wish we had taken Canada too. I love Canada. <laughs> I, I love them as a country, but it'd be great. Wouldn't that be neat if that, we had some states up there? That'd be cool. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Keeping on the money theme, uh, is it true that the Continental uh, Navy members would receive a pension or be eligible for it and not so much so for the privateer yeah. members? Yeah, privateersmen, no, privateersmen did not get any kind of pension. Uh, there were some men like Silas Talbot and others who were privateers during the war, but they were also in the Continental Navy and they often were able to prove proof of service to get some kind of pension or some kind of government support after the war. Although I don't write about that in the book because it's not part of the privateersman's life so much. What I have read about that, it was often quite a battle for these men to get their just rewards from the government, in part because the government was not flush, but also I think a lot of people, the records that they had to provide were not necessarily as good as they might, might have been. I don't, it, all right. So yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. Great talk. Sure. I wondered if you'd run across the name John McPherson, one of our famous privateers. His lovely home was in Fairmont Park, Mount Pleasant. Oh, uh, I wish I could say yes because oh. I'd like to make you happy, but uh, <laughs> but. But no, and, and I'll, I'll answer using a little story. A lot of my books cover huge ranges of, of history. And I'm constantly getting questions like that. I wrote a book about whaling. And I went to Sag Harbor and New London, both big whaling ports. I wrote a 400-page book. Each of those ports gets a page, a page and a half. When I gave talks there, I got so much grief from the local residents. Why do you cover our amazing history? because you have to make choices about narrative, you know, arc. There were so many privateersmen. I could have written a 4,000-page book if I covered all of them. I vaguely, I think I, I, that name sounds familiar, but it might be because other McPhersons I've run across over the years. So a lot of people didn't make it into the book. I get, I get emails from people, is my ancestor in the book? No, but I know your ancestor would want you to buy a copy. No, no, no. And, <laughs> and I, 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 gave, I gave a talk. I, I, I gave a talk on a lighthouse book I wrote. I wrote a book on lighthouses, and I gave a talk in Newburyport, which is near where I live, in a bookstore. And right before the talk began, there's a woman sitting in the front row, and she says, did you write about Plum Island Lighthouse in your book? And I said, no, because Plum Island Lighthouse is in Newburyport. And she goes, no, why not? And I told her why, and she goes, well, I'm not buying a copy of your book. So, and then she glared at me during the whole talk. So, so you know, there were 1,500 lighthouses at one point or another. I only mentioned 106. Anyway, so that's a long way. That's a long answer saying in this book, there are a lot of really wonderful privateersmen, politicians, other individuals who are part of the story in one way or the other that don't get any coverage from me. So. I'm just going to make your life a little more grayer now because... Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, I happen to uh, belong to the Conservancy of the Old Pine Street Church, and we have over, I guess, 25 sea captains and privateers buried there from the oh, Revolutionary wow. War. And I'm looking and I'm listening to you. I'm scrolling through our self-audio tour to see if you name anybody <laughs> that I know. <laughs> so I will be looking for them in your book. Whether they're there or not, I'm still going to buy your book. Okay. But <laughs> okay, you get dessert. <laughs> I'm going to give you the, the app so you can see and you can okay. check it. Make sure maybe well, our history is... is, is well, you can, you can do your own search. Uh, there's a, a book that came out in 1906 that I used uh, called... It's about, uh, it's about naval records of the American Revolution. It was put together by the Library of Congress, and it lists all the privateering vessels and the names of the captains. 
So you can do a search, it's online. You can plug in the search. Also the naval records of the American Revolution, which is different, is like a 14 or 15 volume set. They're only up to 1778, an amazing source. You can find that online and you can search names. So Google's very, Google, Yahoo, whatever, Bing, whatever you want to use. I'm not the researcher. It's very Our great. historian has put this together. It's not me. Okay. But uh, it's been documented and we have wonderful stories about each of these uh, captain, sea captains and privateers that uh -huh. I'll, I'll share with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Get ready for this one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh-oh. <laughs> I promise it's not going to be bad. <laughs> I am a researcher, and I love hearing other people talk about their research processes. I would love for you to tell us more about your archival experiences, uh. about how, when, and where you did your research. Just take us through a little bit of that process. Okay, I, I sort of describe my research as Brownian motion. I don't know if you took sort of physics. I knock into things. What I tend to do when I start doing research on a book is I first try to find, are there any classics in this field that cover it? And then I read those and I get my bearings. But once I start diving into archives, I, I do, and I have to say, I did this all in the research during COVID. So let me start, let me back up, because this might be interesting to you. I signed the contract for this book in February of 2020. And I live in Marblehead. And I, one of the libraries I use extensively is Harvard's Widener Library. I'm a, I have access there. So I often, for all my books, go in there and spend days and days on end with my USB stick. And I download hundreds of articles from early American newspapers, from British newspapers, all these different sources so I can have them in my office. I also scan chapters, sections from scores, or maybe even hundreds of books that the Widener is one of the greatest libraries in the world. So for whatever reason, I didn't know that a COVID national emergency was coming. Three days, three days before it was declared, I said to Jen, my wife, I said, I'm going to go into Cambridge the next two days and get a jump start on, the, on some of the research. So I went and I spent two full days there. I ordered over 100 books, I remember. They, I had to get special permission because there were so many. And I was scanning. I just was, spent two solid days in front of the book eye scanner, scanning, looking at databases. And I came home and then the entire world shut. And I could not have written the book that I wrote without those resources. Uh, I probably could have written a book, but it would have been a very different book. And actually, during... COVID, I still needed to use, you're probably familiar with early American newspapers like Evans, I know they call them different things. I still wanted to do some keyword searches, but the only people that have that are libraries or institutions that could pay for membership. So I called up the company that owns that and I said, can I please get a personal, can I, can I somehow see it? They said, no. I went back, I kept working my way up. I finally got a vice president of the company on the line. I told her who I was, that didn't impress her. And then I said, what I'm doing, I said, please, can I just get a couple of days access? And she was very nice and I thank her in the acknowledgements. Uh, I got, they gave me two weeks, they gave me a special code and from my computer in my office at home, I was able to search early American newspapers for two weeks and download stuff. So uh, that really helped a lot. But, you know, just, there are so many sources, but the world has changed so much. The first book I wrote back in the 90s, I had to go to specialized libraries in order to get primary materials. Now, so many historical societies, so many libraries, so many museums, including this one, I noticed that they're digitizing things that were in the James Fortin exhibit. So much is available online with a few keystrokes that really the problem is not being overwhelmed by too much information and deciding when Good enough is good enough. You don't want better to be an enemy of good enough. And uh, so I've gotten pretty good at it over the years, you know, both my PhD program and I, I really like researching and I'm pretty good at synthesizing a lot of information. Uh, but for, for this book, it was early American newspapers. It was the founders online was wonderful because virtually every founder, minor and major, all of their correspondence is online, searchable by keyword. Um, there's uh, the National Archives had some stuff, the Naval Documents of the American Revolution. There are a number of people 
wrote books right after the American Revolution, history books, uh, the British newspapers, the uh, Remembrancer, which is the one I knock into all the time as a British newspaper, had a lot of articles about American privateers. A lot of them were very negative because it was written by British people, those dastardly pirate, piratical privateers. So the research project takes a long time. Usually it takes me about nine to 10 months just doing research, then I start writing. For this book, since COVID kept me at home and my family wouldn't talk to me during the day, I had a lot more time to work. So I finished this whole book, research and writing, in about 15 months, which is the fastest I've ever done a book. Usually it's closer to 20, 22 months. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Great. Well, thank you so much. And Eric will be around for the rest of the program, but round of applause once again.